All right, hello class. In part two of this lecture for antiderivatives, we're going to be talking about initial value problems and application. Um, and specifically what initial value problems are is, so we have this um, technique where we find antiderivatives with a plus C. Um, all we're really doing with initial value problems is finding a specific C given a specific situation. Okay, so I think it's easier to just get into some examples of how this works and um, it's easier to explain it through examples. And then with that, we can then start looking at applications of antiderivatives, which are going to be very similar to applications of derivatives. They just work in reverse. All right, here's often how this will be presented to you. So find the solution of the following initial value problem f prime of x equals 2x minus 3, where f of 0 equals 3. Okay, so it's giving you a derivative, and, and then it's giving you what we would call an initial value, f of 0 equals 3. So how we would go about um, solving for this, so finding a solution that basically is asking us to find uh, f of x given this information. Well, if we have the derivative, we can find f of x using the integral, right? Uh, the integral of f prime of x dx should be just f of x plus a c, okay? So um, if f prime of x equals 2x minus 3, well, if we integrate both sides, Okay, we'll have that the integral of f prime of dx is equal to the integral of 2x minus 3 dx. And so uh, the integral of f prime dx should be f of x. And the integral of uh, 2x minus 3 will be um, 2x squared over 2, so the 2's cancel, minus 3x plus c. So notice I don't put plus c on both sides here. You only need one plus c for like a string of integrals. You don't need to put a bunch of plus c's. Okay, so uh, f of x is equal to x squared minus 3x plus c. And now we use this f of 0 equals 3. This is what we call the initial value or sometimes the initial condition. And all we're doing here is using it to help us find a specific c, right? Because every antiderivative looks like x squared minus 3x plus c. We want to find the specific antiderivative where f of 0 equals 3, okay? And this is often called the particular antiderivative because we want to find the particular antiderivative or f of 0 equals 3. So sometimes instead of telling you to solve um, an initial value problem, it will tell you to find the particular antiderivative where this happens. So here's what we do, okay? We know that f of 0, we want it to be 3. But we also have f of x equals x squared minus 3x plus c. So on this side, we will plug in 0 to get 0 squared minus 3 times 0 plus c. And then this tells us when we simplify this and ignore this middle part, we have that 3 is equal to c. And there we go. There's our c that we can plug in and get our particular antiderivative. So f of x equals x squared minus 3x plus 3. And this is First of all, the solution to the initial value problem, it's the particular antiderivative that causes this to happen, and it's our final answer. Okay, now what we did here was going to follow pretty much in every example. We're going to um, integrate, plug in a value, and solve for c. All right, let's look at another example. Let's say we have that g prime of x is equal to 7x times x to the 6th minus 1 7th, and we want g of 1 to equal 2. Okay, so we just integrate both sides. And I will say that this right here, what we're doing, 
this is your first example of what a differential equation is. Right? This is a very basic differential equation. So for any of you that have to go on to take differential equations, you're basically seeing the idea. It's where you have a, an equation in terms of derivatives and you want to get back to the original function. That's what we have here. We have a derivative. We want to find g of x. We want to find the original function. Okay. So to integrate this though, we probably want to start by distributing, right, that 7x. So we'll have 7x to the 7 minus, we distribute this across x dx, and that's going to be our g of x. Okay. So integrating this, um, we will get uh, 7 eighths x to the 8 minus 1 half x squared plus c. So there is our um, g of x with a c in it. But remember what we wanted, okay? We want g of 1 to be 2. So g of 1 needs to be 2, and we can set that 2 equal to this with 1 plugged in. So 2 needs to be equal to 7 eighths times 1 to the 8th minus 1 half times 1 squared plus c. Okay, so we want 2 to equal 7 eighths minus a half plus c, and we're going to solve for c. Okay, so the Quickest way to do this, um, I'm going to rewrite this one half in terms of eight, so this will be minus four eighths. Okay, so we'll get two is equal to three eighths plus c. And we'll move this three eighths over to solve for our c. All right, and I'm going to write two as um, it should be 16 eighths minus three eighths is equal to c now. So c, finally, let me do it here. c is 16 eighths minus 3 eighths, so it will be 13 eighths. Okay, so a little nastier than the last one, but still not too bad. Okay, you just solve for c. So this is to show that it's not always zero. You can't always just let c be this number that we have here. Okay, that's a mistake I see a lot is just assuming that C is always this number. It won't be. So in this case, our final answer, G of X, is going to be 7 eighths X to the eighth minus 1 half X squared plus 13 eighths. And there we go. Okay, so here's an example of another way that this could be worded. Um, it's to find the antiderivative that satisfies the given condition f of x equals 3 over t plus 6, where capital F of 1 equals 8. So this isn't written in terms of f prime, just f, the capital F for our antiderivative. Okay? But we would do it in the same way, right? We would integrate both sides. So we have the integral of f of x dx is equal to the integral of 3 over t plus 6 dt. And this would give us, get us to our capital F of x. And here we would just integrate. So 3 over t. Well, we could rewrite this as 3 times 1 over t. And hopefully that will help show that that should be 3 times the natural log absolute value of t. And plus, well, the integral of 6 is simply 6t, and we'll have plus c. Okay, so here's our capital F of x, and now we're going to apply the initial condition. So we want f of 1. Well, if we plug 1 in, uh, 3 natural log of 1, that goes to 0. Then we'll have plus 6 times 1 plus c. However, we need f of 1 to equal 8. So this needs to equal 8. So we have 6 plus c is equal to 8. 
So move that 6 over to get that C is equal to 2. And there we go. All right, plug that in, and that will give us our final integral. That capital F of X is equal to 3. Natural log, the absolute value of T, plus 6T, plus 2. And there we go. There's our final answer. Okay. For another example, let's find the solution of this initial value problem. Say u prime of x is equal to x times e to the 2x plus 4e to the x all over x e to the x. So we know that our first step um, is going to be integrating this, but we will need to simplify this algebraically. And then we also have these conditions that u of 1 is equal to 0 and x is greater than 0. Okay, so I want to start by simplifying this. Um, u prime of x, I'm going to split this fraction up to get x times e to the 2x over x e to the x plus 4e to the x over x e to the x. So here, the e to the x is canceled. Here the x's cancel, okay? And then here, um, well, there are a lot of ways you could simplify this, but maybe the quickest way to think about it would be, that would be e to the 2x minus x since you're dividing. So this will just be e to the x when it's all said and done, all right? So u prime of x is simply e to the x plus 4 over x. All right, and now we can integrate. So we'll take the integral of u prime, which will be the integral of e to the x plus 4 over x dx. So when we integrate, we'll get down to u of x. Integral of e to the x is itself. And the integral of 4 over x, well, that's going to be 4 times the natural log of the absolute value of x and we'll get a plus C. Okay, now we want to solve for the C, so we'll plug in the 1, and that will give us E to the 1 plus 4 natural log of 1. Well, I will note that we could actually drop the absolute value bars since we are assuming X is positive, so we could just say um, x there. I'm not going to do that just yet, but that'll go to 0. Then we'll have plus c, and we want this to be equal to 0. So we have e plus c is equal to 0, so c is equal to negative e. So a final answer will be u of x is equal to e to the x plus 4 ln x minus e. And we can drop the absolute value bars because we know and we're told that x is positive. All right, so there we go. All right, let's look at another example and then we'll start talking about applications. So let's find the solution of the following initial value problem. So we have the f prime or sorry, v prime of theta is root 2 times cosine squared theta plus 1 all over cosine squared theta. And we want v of pi over 4 to be equal to 3. All right, so once again, like before, we're going to want to simplify this. So in this case, we will split up the fraction to get root 2 times cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta plus 1 over cosine squared theta. All right, so the cosine squareds cancel there, so we're left with a v prime of theta is equal to square root of 2 plus um, 1 over cosine squared theta, also known as secant squared theta. So now I'm going to not write all the integral signs this time. To get from v prime to v, we integrate. Okay, so that's what we are doing here is integrating. 
both sides to get from v prime to v. And so here we will have root 2 times theta, and the integral of secant squared is tangent theta. Okay, and so now we will um, apply our, oh, and a plus c, sorry, plus c. Now we will apply our initial condition to solve for c. Okay, so we'll plug in pi over 4. So we will get square root of 2 times pi over 4, okay, plus tangent of pi over 4, plus c is equal to 3. And tangent of pi over 4 is 1. Okay, so we're going to get root 2 pi over 4 plus 1 plus c is equal to 3. All right, so c is not going to be pretty, but we can easily move the 1 over and get a 2 on this side, and then subtract this nasty thing over to get that c is equal to 2 minus the square root of 2 pi over 4. And frankly, I would just put it in like that, okay, so that we have our final answer which is v of theta is equal to square root of 2 theta plus tan theta and plus 2 minus root 2 pi all over 4. Okay, and there we go. All right, so why would we ever want to do this? Why would we ever care about what our constant is? Seems kind of silly in just a sort of abstract sense, but it actually comes down to cases where we might know the velocity or the acceleration um, of an object and we want to know its position. Right? Because if you remember, if we had position, we could use the derivative to get to velocity. And from velocity, we could use another derivative to get to acceleration. Well, let's say we don't know position. Say we just know the acceleration, right? Say we, um, I don't know, drop a rock um, off of a, a cliff. We know the acceleration of gravity, so we could work our way back to position using integrals, right? So we can get from acceleration back to velocity, then from velocity back to position using integration. Okay, so um, this is really helpful because a lot of times all we know is the acceleration, right? Sometimes all we know is the velocity. If you're, say, driving in your car and you look down at your speedometer, it's not telling you your position. It's telling your, you your velocity at each second, okay? So you could get your velocity by looking at your speedometer, but to get your position would take a little more work, and that's where the integral comes in. Okay, so let's look at some examples of um, how we can uh, apply integration to um, work problems like this, say from acceleration to position, but there are other cases too that we can take a look at. All right, so here's a, a fairly uh, standard example. Let's say a car starting at rest um, just begins to accelerate at 16 feet per second squared for five seconds on a straight road. Okay, how far did it travel during this time? So here is where we need integration to help us because if this were the velocity, if we were told that the car uh, had a velocity of 16 feet per second for 5 seconds, we could just take this 16 and, and multiply by 5 to get the distance traveled because that's the easy way to get from a constant velocity to distance is you just multiply the two. However, it's not velocity, right? This is acceleration, okay? So we need to use integration a couple of times to get back to position. So to set this up, our acceleration function is just 16. 
Right? We, we're only accelerating at 16 feet per second squared for five seconds. So we could say that our acceleration function is 16 for t between 0 and 5 seconds. Okay. Then if we integrate both sides, well, the integral of a of t, the acceleration, will be the velocity, v of t. And the integral of 16 will just be 16t plus c. OK, now what is c going to be? And that's where this part comes in, a car starting at rest. So at rest, this is telling us what our initial velocity is. At rest means the initial velocity is 0. Okay. So the initial velocity is 0. That means v of 0 needs to be 0. All right. So if we plug that in, v of 0 will be 16 times 0 plus c equals 0. So this gets us that c is equal to 0. So we will zero that out. Okay. So our velocity function is v of t is simply 16t. Okay. Now we're going to take a step to uh, position. Right? So now we will uh, integrate again to get the integral of v of t is equal to the integral of 16t dt. And the integral of the velocity is going to be the position, s of t. And so the integral of 16t will be 8t squared plus, I'll use d here, okay? And the total distance traveled, right, how far did we travel during this time? Well, we have some information that would let us solve for d, but it's, it's not going to matter because um, if we take s of 0, right, s of 0 is d, right, and then if we take s of 5, it's going to be 8 times 25 plus d, right? Um, it doesn't really matter what our starting position is if I want the displacement, which in this case should be the same as the total distance traveled, it will be s of 5 minus s of 0, and as we'll see, um, that's going to be, that comes out to be 200 plus d minus d. Those constants just cancel out, right? So it's going to be 200, I believe we were in feet. Okay, so that car travels a total of 200 feet in those five seconds. Okay, so notice we could have just done S of 5 to get 200, assuming we could have just said, let's assume our initial position is 0. You could totally do that here. Okay, all right, let's, um, let's look at another example. All right, so for our next example, let's say a car is moving at 60 miles per hour, and we're going to be looking at this in feet, so that's 88 feet per second. On a straight road, when the driver steps on the brake pedal and begins decelerating at a constant acceleration of 10 feet per second squared for three seconds, how far did the car go during this three-second interval? Okay, so once again, we're given the acceleration. You might also think that we are given the velocity. However, this is just the initial velocity, right? We're, we're starting at 60 miles per hour and then we hit the brake. That means the velocity should be slowing down, right? It should be um, decreasing. So this is just the initial velocity. All right. So, um, that's why we can't just multiply this by the three seconds. That would tell us how far we would go if we had traveled the 88 feet per second for three seconds, but that's not what's happening. We're slowing down over three seconds. So it's the acceleration, A of t, that we have, and specifically it's negative 10, right, because we're decelerating. We're, we're going down at constant acceleration of 10 feet per second. Okay. 
and this is over three seconds, so t is between zero and three. All right, then, well, we can integrate. So we can get from a to v through integration, All right? So if we integrate both sides, v of t is going to be uh, negative 10t plus c, okay? And here is where we can use our initial velocity. The initial velocity is we're in, this is in feet per second squared, so we need to use the feet per second version. Um, so the initial velocity, v of zero, well, plugging that in here gives us c, and so c needs to be 88, okay? So our actual velocity function, v of t, is negative 10t plus 88, okay? Now, to get to position, we integrate again. Right, so from v to s, we take another integral and get negative 5t squared plus 88t plus, I'll use d here, and I'm going to assume initial position is 0. So s of 0, if when we plug in 0, we'll get 0 plus 0 plus d equals 0. It's not really going to matter in this particular case. So our position function is s of t equals negative 5t squared plus 88t. We're starting at 0, and, and we should be increasing from there, right? Because we have a, a downwards opening parabola here, and one of the roots is 0. Right? So really, we just need to um, plug in our 3 to find the total distance traveled here. All right? So s of 3 will be negative 5 times 9 plus 88 times 3, which is going to be 219 feet. Now, what I want to talk about here is notice this came out to be a parabola and went up and then back down, okay? That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? And that's why we were given this just in terms of 0 to 3, because if we were to put in, um, let's say, a higher number, right? If you were to put in something like 20, like over 20 seconds, you would get a negative position. Right, 240, uh, negative 240 feet, which might not make much sense. But if we look at the graph, so here's an actual graph of this. Um, we're assuming a um, negative acceleration, a constant negative acceleration the entire time. If that were to continue going, eventually the car comes to a complete stop. And that's what we're seeing right here. This is our position, and eventually the car comes to a complete stop. Now, if the negative acceleration continues, then the car is going to turn around and start backing up and going in reverse. That's not that accurate, right? Um, but that's what this model would say if that happened, okay? So this is really only accurate to when we're told over the three seconds what is happening, okay? So... We only really need to consider this all the way up to about 9, but we were only told this was happening over 3 seconds. Okay, so um, that is one thing to consider when looking at things like this, is if we assume this constant acceleration forever, it starts to, um, our car comes to a complete stop and then starts rolling backwards, right? But that's not what would happen. What would actually happen is it would stop here, and then we would just get that same value the entire time if we didn't move anymore. Right? Or it might level off and then start increasing again. Okay, So that's something to keep in mind with these sort of models. that they, um, They're only accurate in, in the interval of interest, right, to, to quote, the phrasing of a previous lesson. 
All right, so let's say that we have, for our next example, a mass on a spring oscillates up and down, and we want to find its position, S, relative to the equilibrium position if its acceleration is A of t equals 2 sine t, and its initial velocity and position are V of 0 equals 3 and S of 0 equals 0, respectively. So here's how... Um, Here's how this sort of idea works. Um, if you have a, like a mass on a spring, say we have this mass and it's sitting on a spring, its equilibrium position would be where it would naturally just sit, right? If we didn't jostle it, we just gave it time to, to finally settle down and stop, okay? This is what we would consider the equilibrium position, right? Um, where it sits naturally. Right, and we consider this position to be zero. And then anything up here will have positive position, and anything down here will have negative position. Okay, so what we're given here is the acceleration of this mass and its initial velocity and position. Its initial position is s of zero. So it's actually starting here at the equilibrium. And this is what's interesting. Its initial velocity is three. That means it's starting here, but something is pushing it. Maybe someone's pushing it or some force is acting on it so that its velocity is three. Maybe it's meters per second. Maybe it's feet per second feet per minute, whatever it is, um, its initial velocity is being pushed in that positive direction. Okay, and this would work if it was a spring sort of this way, right? It, that, its orientation in this sense doesn't really matter that much, um, but that's what's happening. So the idea is it pushes up this way and then starts to oscillate back and forth. Okay, so we want to find the position function. Okay, so to find the position function, we start with a of t equals 2 sine t, and then we integrate to get to the velocity. All right, well, the integral of 2 sine t is going to be negative 2 cosine t plus c. So remember, um, when you integrate sine, it gives you a negative cosine. Okay, that's an easy thing to get mixed up. All right, then we are going to use that initial velocity here. So the initial velocity, v of 0, is 3. Now here, negative 2 cosine of 0 plus c. Well, cosine of 0 is 1. All right, so we're going to get the equation 3 is equal to negative 2 plus c. So C, in this case, is 5. So that's going to be put back into here. All right. So our final V of T is going to be negative 2 cosine T plus 5. All right, so there's our velocity. Now we're going to get back to our position. All right, and we'll do another integral. So the integral of negative 2 cosine t is going to be negative 2 sine t. So remember, with an integral, cosine does not introduce a, a negative. And it will be plus 5t plus, I'll use capital D here. Okay. And now, well, our initial position is the equilibrium. It's 0. Okay. So s of 0 is 0. When we plug 0 in here, that will be 0 plus 0 plus d, so d is equal to 0. So our final position function is negative 2 sine t plus 5t. All right, so let's take a look at a graph of that. Right. If we look at this example, um, this is our position away from the equilibrium, 
and it seems like we never get back to equilibrium based on that initial uh, velocity. All right, which is kind of crazy, maybe not that realistic, but um, also kind of interesting. Okay, so a, an interesting question from here would be something like, um, well, what initial velocity would cause it to, to settle back down to, um, to its equilibrium? Okay, um, not something that we will necessarily consider in, in this class, but it, hopefully just showing where this idea can end up going. Okay, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and end it there. Should definitely be enough to get you rolling on the homework. And I will catch you all on the next video. Cheers.